Thank you, Michael. Well, the obvious question out there might be, why are we reading from the Gospel of John when we're doing a series on the book of Revelation? What does the one have to do with the other? And again, the, the obvious answer that comes to mind is, well, they have the same author, right? John wrote the Gospel of John. John wrote the book of Revelation. But the, the thing I want to bring out here is that in this most familiar portion of Scripture, John 3.16 and, and the verses following, we immediately see what we've seen all through the book of Revelation, and that is that there are two groups of people. Always two groups of people. There are those who believe and those who don't believe. Right? As many who believed in the name of Christ, Jesus Christ, will be saved. Those that don't, won't. So it, that begs another question, though. Why do some believe and why do some not believe? And we've talked about that as we've worked our way through the book of Revelation and, and we pretty well have a handle on it. Those who don't believe, it's because of the hardness of their hearts, they won't believe. And it's amazing to me that no matter what happens in their lifetime, in their time frame, they steadfastly refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. It's always amazed me how two people can walk into a church service as unbelievers, and they can be of the same socioeconomic class, they can be uh, highly educated or uneducated, doesn't matter, they'll listen to the message, and one of them will say, yes, that's what I've been looking for. Yes. I want Christ. And the other one will shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's a bunch of fooey. Now, what's the difference in the two? Is one a good person and the other one a bad person? No, they're both bad people. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, <laughs> are we not? <laughs> I mean, if, if, the, if the yardstick is total righteousness... Are any of us good people? No, we're not. The difference is the Holy Spirit makes the word alive to the one. And for reasons we have no idea, he doesn't to the other. Well, as we've worked our way through the book of Revelation and we come to the 16th chapter today, we're going to see the, the final series of judgments and then we're going to look at the bowls now. We, we've looked at the seals. We saw that scenario, right? We looked at the trumpets. Now we're going to look at the bowls. And the thing we have to constantly uh, remind ourselves of, they are all three dealing with the same time span, just from different perspectives. They're dealing with the time span uh, from when Christ died on a cross until Christ comes again. So we're somewhere in that continuum, aren't we? We, we know we're 2,100 years removed from the time this period started. We have no idea how long this period will last. But we know we are taking a part of it. We are part of this historic epic, if you will, as God brings things to the conclusion that he has preordained for all history. Now, there's no place that we see this idea of men and women hardening their hearts and refusing to come to God than in these various three scenarios. We saw it in the, the seals in chapter 6. We saw it in the trumpets in chapters 8 through 9. For instance, you remember the seal scenario as we went through when we got to the final one, what was the unbelievers comment. What was their request? They did have a request. And it wasn't, oh God, we want to be your people. It was hide us for who can stand. You remember that? So God took them through all of these things, trying to bring them to himself, but they would not come. Now, I find this particular wording that they their response was to hide very interesting because where do we first see that in scripture Adam and Eve very good they sinned they transgressed against God's law for them and what was their first reaction when God approached them 
to hide. Now it's amazing to me, here they are, Adam and Eve sinned, God had given them everything, they were in a perfect environment, and yet they, they sinned anyway. Now if, if I were God, I'd have probably just erased them, <laughs> started over with a new couple, <laughs> made them a little smarter. But that's not the way our God works. What does he do? He, he comes to the garden to meet with them, to help them. And what do they do? They hide. So that's a, a common thing in the human experience. It's not that God is hiding from us. It's that we try to hide from him, but it's a futile effort. He finds us, and we will either face judgment or we will face reconciliation. One of the two. We see it uh, in the trumpet scenarios. Remember at the end of the trumpet scenarios they said this, they did not repent of worshiping idols or of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. And you say, well pastor, that has nothing to do with me. I, I mean, I'm not sexually immoral. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a thief. I don't worship idols. Oh, really? What is the, you know, what did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount about these sorts of things? He said, remember, he said, the law says if you kill your brother, I'm, now I'm paraphrasing, you're a murderer. But I say, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. The law says, don't commit adultery. But I say, if you lust after someone in your heart, you have already committed adultery. Now let me rephrase the question to you again, and please don't give me an audible answer. <laughs> How many of you have ever committed murder? How many of you have ever committed adultery? Now according to Jesus' standard, and please don't confess here in public. <laughs> but you see where he's coming from. Now let me bring it home even a little more with the idolatry issue. Here's a definition of idolatry for you. Anything, an idol is anything that comes before God or comes between you and God or replaces God in your life. Now again, I pose the question, and please don't answer. Are any of you idolaters? Is there anything in your life that comes before God? I don't know. Is there anything in your life that comes between you and God? You know, things that keep you from, from worshiping God as you should. I don't know. Is there anything that replaces God in your life? I don't know. But I think we all struggle with those things. The difference between the believer and the unbeliever isn't that the believer's heart is so pure, because believe me, we're not. The difference is we fess up and we repent. We confess our sins and God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And now we will see it again in the bowls. And at the end of the bowls we'll read this, and they cursed God for the plague that came upon them. Seals, trumpets, bowls. There's a progression, isn't there? And there's a progression here that we see. The progression of the hardening of hearts of those who refuse to believe. Notice it goes from passive hiding to active disobedience to arrogant blasphemy. I'm going to hide. I'm going to disobey. I'm going to shake my fist at God and tell him I'm going to do it my way. You see, there's a progression to the hardening of our hearts. And we need to guard against that. If God does not intervene, 
we are all doomed by our own choices. Because remember the issue is whosoever will may come. The issue is the will. And we always, always without the Holy Spirit's intervention will against God. Today and in the next couple of chapters, we're, we're given a close-up view of the final battle where God destroys Satan and his representatives. We're introduced today uh, to Babylon the Great, and we're not going to talk much about it today at all, but we will in the next couple of weeks. And, and God is going to do away with all that. Until now, we've seen only partial expressions of God's wrath. You may remember uh, we started out with the seals and, and remember they, they affected a quarter of the earth and then we moved to the trumpets and as the trumpets were blown they affected a third of the earth and now when we come to the bowls they affect the whole thing. But now remember they're all the same time period and I know it's hard uh, but try, try to hang in there with that. So let's look at these bowls. And they take place in the, in the chapter here, the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation. And I'm not going to read it all for you, uh, but I hope you read it for yourselves as a unit this afternoon or sometime. But let's get a reminder again of how we read the book of Revelation from our, our good friend who's become our good friend, uh, Dennis Johnson, from his uh, commentary. Here's what he says. He says, all interpreters recognize and... and that's yeah, probably not a good word there. Who am I to argue with Dr. Dennis Johnson? But I think I would say most or some. I don't, I don't think all interpreters agree on anything. But anyway, he does. So I would say all interpreters should agree, by the way. But they don't. All interpreters recognize that the outpouring of each bowl is not a physical action, but a symbol of world devastation that is purposed by God's sovereign will and executed by His almighty power. The effects of the outpoured bowls are symbolic expressions, not photographic reproductions. Okay? So remember, we're dealing in imagery and, and that sort of thing. So we have to just keep that in the forefront of our minds. The, eff the effects of the bowls are terrifying. They are going on simultaneously with the seals and the trumpets. Now you say, how can that be? Well, I don't know. I just know it is. Because God's word says it is. I'll tell you one way, though, um, that we might look at it. For instance, we have seals that are bad, trumpets that are worse, bowls that are the worst. Okay? And let's say they're all going on at the same time. Well, it might be this way. And might is an important word here, because I don't know. But I'm just suggesting. If you live in North America, Canada, the United States, you might feel like, well, we're in the, the, the seals. Because it's, 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 we struggle. We have a little bit of persecution, you know, not much, but a little bit. And we don't like the way our country's going. But it's not too bad. Now, if you're in, say, let's say Europe, Eastern Europe, you might think, oh, I don't know. I, I think maybe we're living in the time of the trumpets because things are, are worse over here. And they're not as bad as they were in the 50s and 60s. So they're, they're still bad. There's a lot of things Christians can't do. We have limits on our freedom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Now, if you're living in some parts of Africa, some parts of India, China, and on it goes, you might say, man, you guys are crazy. We're living in the bowls. You know, they come in here and they kill Christians and they burn the churches down. And it's bad. This is the great tribulation. It's terrible. Now that's just a suggestion, but it kind of helps me make sense of the thing. They may be all going on right at the same time. Well, let's look at the effects of these bowls. The first thing we see is quite, now here's a word you may not be expecting, the first bowl is dumped out and what we see is very comforting. Did you expect to be comforted by the first bowl? 
No, I, I didn't, didn't think he would. But the effect is very comforting. Look with me at verse 2 of chapter 16. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worship his image. Pastor, are you crazy? How can harmful and painful sores be comforting? But look, we have a high degree of specificity here. It doesn't say that bulls and sores appeared on all people, does it? It gives a specific group of people. And who are they? They are the people who bore the mark of the beast and worship its image. There's a group that's excluded, isn't there? Oh, and we remember that, the, that group because we met them just a little while back in chapter 13, verse 8. When we were trying to determine who would and wouldn't uh, succumb to this mark of the beast thing. And all who dwell on the earth who worship it, the beast, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb, who was slain. So those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life don't suffer from these sores and this plague. That's good news, guys. So if that angel was hovering over Camus and Washougal right now and dumped that bowl, if you're a believer, it's not going to affect you. Now that's pretty cool. That's comforting. Let me uh, read from the Apostle Paul, Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. <clears throat> now do you read anything in there about boils and pestilence and plague coming upon you? No, you read about grace being lavished upon you and love before the beginning of time. You are a separate people. And I think it's Peter who, who uses this terminology, you are a peculiar people. Not meaning that you're weird, but meaning that you're different because you're believers. Now some of you are weird, but, but it doesn't mean you have to be weird. Some of you think I'm weird. <laughs> I can count on Jim. Because believers bear the seal of the Holy Spirit, we will not be affected by the plagues. Again, it's not because we're good folks. It's not because we're better than the other folks. It's because we bear the mark of the Holy Spirit. John refers to it as a seal. We're sealed from all of that. You know, now, you know, this isn't a new scenario. Remember one of the other things we learned about the book of Revelation is there's nothing new in it. It's an expansion of everything that comes before it in Scripture. Now, think with me for just a moment. This should be an easy one for, for most of you. Where do we first see this idea of God bringing judgment upon some people and not on others? I knew you'd get it. How about Exodus chapter 12? Now, we've seen a lot of of, of Exodus in this Revelation story, haven't we? we? We see a lot of roots there. Well, what happens in Exodus chapter 12? God says, Moses has been going to the, the Pharaoh, you know, and the Pharaoh keeps hardening his heart, and God hardens the Pharaoh's heart, and God says, okay, Moses, this is it. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to tell all of my people, the Israelites, to kill a lamb and take the blood and put the blood on their doorposts and tonight when I visit the country I'm going to kill the firstborn of all the unbelievers. 
But when I see the blood on the doorpost, I'll pass over your house. Wow. I don't know. But that's where the roots of this imagery come from. Now, we know what happened. Just as God said it would. And the people of Egypt rose up. And they didn't just let the people go. They get out of here. Here, let us help you on your way. And they gave them stuff and go. We don't like you here anymore. Well, the same thing happens today. If you're a believer and you live in an unbelieving world, the fact that you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that you're a sealed, sanctified saint, is not going to endear you very much to the unbelievers. Now, I'm sure you've all experienced that, unless you just don't tell anybody you're a believer. Okay. The unbelievers, the people who dwell on the earth, never really care for the believers. And thus, the believers have always been persecuted. Go clear back to Exodus, and you can see it. There was an interesting event happened in Europe in the 1300s, there was a small fleet of ships, and they came and uh, they landed at Messina, and they became known as the death ships, because they brought cargo from China, and along with the cargo they brought the Black Death, the bubonic plague. Okay. In five years, one-third of Europe's population was wiped out. 25 million people. Boom. Dead. But there was one segment of the population that was markedly less affected, less susceptible to the plague than any other group. Now, who might that have been? That was the Jews. And for some reason, the Jewish community, which was always driven together in ghettos. They always just lived that way. But for some reason, they didn't get the plague like everybody else. So, in a 14th century world, what is the assumption everybody else makes? Well, if they don't get it, and we get it, this must be a plot that they've come up with. They've poisoned the water, and they're trying to do away with all of us. So what's our solution to that? We'll do away with them. You know, and they did all over Europe. They killed Jews, kind of a wholesale thing. And of course, you, you can understand the reason the Jews were less susceptible to the plague is, for one, they stuck to themselves in their own community. For two, uh, they followed the, the hygiene and things recommended here in, in Scripture. And so they just were a, a, more, a cleaner, more hygienic people than everybody else was. How many of you ever heard of the Valentine's Day Massacre? When did it happen? 1929, somebody said that. That's true. But I want to tell you about the other St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Yeah, and the, by the way, the one in 1929, what was it? Seven people, I think it was, were killed. That's pretty bad, isn't it? Seven. Jeez, horrendous. Gun down. Al Capone did them in. Must have been a racist thing, because they were all Irish that got killed, and all Italians. Uh huh? that did the killing. But anyway, St. Valentine's Day, 1349, in Strasbourg. The plague's going on. The Jews are in their ghetto. The town folk rise up, storm the ghetto, kill don't know how many, but they took 900 and burned them alive because they were different, because they were separate, because they claimed to be God's people. It shouldn't surprise us. Now, what, we, what it should cause us to do is, is fall on our knees and thank God that we don't live in that kind of environment. You know, sure, we get poked fun out, we get told we're goofy and, and stuff like that, but, but we don't have to put up with that kind of stuff. But here's what Jesus said. In John, 
again, chapter 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Okay. So we're in pretty good company when the world dislikes us, when the world hates us, when the world makes fun of us. They did the same thing to Jesus when he was here. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't be surprised. The second thing we see here in verses 4 through 7. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, and it is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. What's one thing that comes to mind, even in a staunch believer's heart, when I recount the story of Exodus 12, and I say the Spirit moved and killed all these children, but passed over these other children? I'll bet you there's a little part of your mind, if not a big part, that cries out, it's not just, it's not fair. There is in my mind. And that's what the angel here is combating. He's saying God is holy and just in his judgments, whether you understand them or not. God is just. If you struggle with the justice and righteousness of God, if you struggle with the idea that God determines whom he's going to save and who he isn't, I'd encourage you to read Romans chapter 9. Just read it and reread it and reread it until you get it. See? Because Paul in Romans chapter 9, especially verse 20, if you don't want to read the whole thing, You know, it's just after he says, one I've loved, one I've hated, Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. Before they ever did, now this is, this is important, before they ever did anything good or bad, when they were still in their mother's womb, I loved this one, I hated that one. And Paul anticipates the objection. And so then he says in verse 20, he says, Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Provocative question, isn't it? When we want to question his righteousness, when we want to question his judgment, he says, Who are you to question me? Same thing he said to Job, if you remember, in the book of Job. Where were you when I formed the earth? Where were you when I raised Leviathan? Where were you when I put the stars in the sky? And you want to question me? That's God talking to Job. See? And by the way, all through the book of Job, his question to God is our question to God. Why? And God never tells him. You can look over in Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. And God says, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, all the things on the earth, all the people of the earth are nothing to me. I will do what I please. Now to us, that's not, geez, that's awful arrogant, but this is God. So it's not arrogant at all. It's kind of like Yogi Berra said, it ain't bragging if you can do it. You know? So when you come to these portions of Scripture where you just want to go, oh, geez, how do I explain that to my friends? You just have to know that God is just and His judgments are just. For centuries, the people of the earth, remember that's the unbelievers, that's a, a term used here in Revelation 4, the people of the earth persecuted and killed God's people and now it's judgment day 
Verse 5. The third angel poured out his bowl, and the rivers and the springs of water became blood. Oh, that should remind us of what? The plagues in Exodus, sure. See? It's judgment day. And, and notice we have a little time frame marker here again where it says the God who is and who was. Now we've seen that once before too, haven't we, here in, here in our book of Revelation towards the end of one of the, the previous cycles. And you remember all the other places we see that phrase, it says the God who was, who is, and is to come, right? But now it's just the God who was and who is, because he has come in this time. Okay? The time has come, and God is answering the question of the martyrs, remember in chapter 6, as they cried out to God, when, when, O oh Lord, will we receive justice? And God told them to just be patient. And in his time, he would take care of it. And by the way, a little footnote for you. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Remember that. We are supposed to be, as believers, patient when we are wronged and wait and let God sort it all out. Now, we don't like that either. I don't like that. I want to shoot him. And God says, no. Vengeance is mine. I'll take care of it. You just take it easy until the time comes. The third thing we see is the unbeliever's response. And we see that their response in verse 9 was to curse God. In verse 11, they did not repent of their deeds. They even challenged God. In 1614, we see they gleefully gather for the kill. Now, this is how, how arrogant they are. Let's look here at verse 14. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of the Almighty. You see, in their arrogance now, they actually think that they're going to be able to pull this army together and defeat God. Now, we've known people like that. They're so full of themselves, they're a God unto themselves. And what they don't understand is the heavens are watching as they gather this great army and they think they're going to just, you know, conquer everything. And the heavens are just waiting. And I don't think God thinks this way, but if it were me, you know, I'd be thinking, yeah, boys, bring it on. We got a little surprise for you coming. They've lost all touch. God is demonstrating to them over and over and over, hey, I can crush you. I can destroy you. You'd better turn and repent. And they say, no. No, we want to fight. And in the next couple of the chapters, we will see the futility of their fight. And finally, we see another blessing amidst the terror. In verse 15, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Whoa. A little bit of Genesis there again, huh? Remember, they were naked, they were exposed, they were ashamed. But now God says, I'm going to bless the one who is awake and spiritually clothed in the midst of all this terror. What's he talking about? He's talking about, or who's he talking about? He's talking about the sealed ones. And notice, he doesn't say, blessed is the one if he stays awake. There's no contingency here. He says, blessed is this person who stays awake and who is spiritually clothed. In other words, the sealed ones. We are spiritually awake. We're spiritually alive because the Holy Spirit has made us that way. We are spiritually equipped to work through these things and there will be great blessing in this. 
and it will be especially important at the end of time. That's you he's talking about. So you don't have to wonder. You know, I was raised in a denomination where you always had to wonder, well, will I take the mark of the beast? Will I cave in? Will I, will I fail? Yeah, we'll all fail. But no, none of us will take the mark of the beast because we're already sealed. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to worry. Now, we may have to endure some things. But we will be clothed. And they cursed God. And that's the way our chapter ends. People being blessed, people cursing God. Two groups of people. Unbelievers, believers. Two responses. Cursing and blessing. Oh, we see that, don't we, too? Also, Exodus, Leviticus, cursings and blessings. Yeah. The most important question you'll ever ask is which group of people do I belong to? Am I in the unbelievers camp? Will I be cursing God when he reveals himself to me? And believe me, if you're in a believers camp, you will. Or am I or in the unbelievers camp? Or I am I in the believers camp? And I will fall on my knees in adoration and praise. Will you be spiritually naked and afraid? Or, or will you be spiritually clothed with God's Holy Spirit? Only two places. Only two choices. I, I would just urge you with everything within me that if you're in the unbelievers camp, now's the time to move to the believers camp because we have no idea how long this thing's going to last before God brings it to an end. You know? I'd fall on my knees. You don't. You can do it physically. You can do it emotionally inside with your heart, because God. That's where God looks, and say, Lord Jesus, I want to be a believer. I want to be part of your kingdom. And it's done. You're in. And then it's just a matter of growing in His grace, receiving His mercy, and His love. So we're going to close with a word of prayer. And if you've never done that, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, please, just in the quietness of your heart, say, I need you, Lord Jesus. I need a Savior. I want to be in the camp that's praising you when you come back. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this marvelous and in some ways inscrutable book of Revelation. But you are revealing it to us more and more as we continue to work through it. We're beginning to see more and more of the patterns. We're beginning to see uh, both your love and your justice. And Lord, bring us to the point where we can love both because they're both part of you. You, you cannot be bifurcated. You, you cannot be one and not have the other. Your love comes from your justice. Your justice comes from your love and they are inseparable. And so, Lord God, if there's anyone here who's made that decision today, I, just, I pray that you're, you will truly make yourself real to them, that you'll bring them into your family, that you'll cause them to grow in your grace. And now, Father, we ask again that you bless our country, that you lift us up, put us on a, a sure footing and a, a proper heading. And we ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.